again, friends. Thank you for joining me. I always look forward to our time together. And let me just start today. If these videos have been a blessing to you, please subscribe to our channel. Share the share it with your friends and family. Like the videos and then ring the bell. Click on the bell so that you'll be notified every time we release a new video. And as we get started today, I'm going to start back in Philippians chapter 3, where we ended in the last video. Now, one thing we saw, we went to Matthew chapter 4, we saw Jesus, his response to, the, to Satan in his temptation, is that man shall live by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. In Romans chapter 10 and verse 17, Paul tells us that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. If you read the whole chapter, he talks about how shall they hear except for someone be sent? And how should they preach it without the word? The message of salvation, the message that we preach, the message by which we live is the word of God. One danger we get into in talking about faith is a lot of times people replace the word with checklists. They replace relationship with requirements. The Old Testament law was given to show us the fact that we were unable to achieve salvation. We were unable to achieve any type of relationship with God in our own effort and our own work. The law was given to show us our need for Jesus. Jesus came. He went to that cross. He suffered horrible, horrible death. He suffered tremendous torture, just things unimaginable to us. He descended into the grave, the Bible tells us. He experienced all of the punishment for every man, woman, and child who will ever live upon this earth in the depths of hell. And then on the third day, he was raised from that grave. Why did he do that? He did that to set us free from the requirements of the law. But unfortunately, in teaching faith, in teaching grace, a lot of times we bring people back into requirements. You hear ministers talk about, well, that person didn't receive because they just didn't have enough faith. But again, as we've seen and we've talked about so many times in these videos, the faith by which we live in Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20 is the faith of the Son of God. Mark chapter 11, verse 22, we just said it and we said it in the previous video, have faith from God. And then here in, in Philippians chapter 3, in verse 9, it says, be And be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through faith of Christ. Through the faith of Christ. This is a continuous thread you keep, we keep seeing in the Bible. The faith of Jesus. The faith of Christ. Faith from God. The measure of faith. Do you see what we're that there's a big difference between your faith and the faith of God. God knows that we are unable to do this on our own. God knows that we will fail left to ourselves. We, Mankind proved that during the 2,000 years that they lived under the law, after the law was given through Moses to the Israelite people. They continuously failed in their efforts to serve God because we are unable to do anything without a redeemer and jesus is that redeemer he came to set us free now does this mean that once we receive jesus we can live any way we want your relationship with god is not based on your works it's not based on whether you get everything right every single day it does it's not based on whether you make a mistake or not make a mistake you are not going to change God's viewpoint of you. In John chapter 3 and verse 16, it says, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He so loved you that he gave Jesus before you took your first breath. When you sin, when you make a mistake, when you come short, when you don't get things completely right, he loves you equally as if you got things right every single day. The problem with sin today is not that it changes God's perception of you, and not that it causes you to lose your salvation, as some will teach. The problem of sin 
is it creates a barrier in a relationship with, between you and God. Not that God is putting up that barrier, but within your own soul, it causes you to pull back. Because as it says in Romans chapter 8, and verse 1, there is no condemnation in Christ Jesus. But if you are living with an awareness of your failures, if, you, if you're living in a, an awareness of your shortcomings, you are going to condemn yourself. And in that condemnation, you're going to create a barricade that is going to hinder you from being able to look to God. The Holy Spirit will still be with you. He's, Jesus said that he, in John chapter 16, that he would be with you forever. The Holy Spirit's not going anywhere. But your ability to perceive his presence will be hindered. The other problem with sin for the New Testament believer is it opens a door for Satan to work in your life. But, again, it does not change God's perception of you because his perception of you and your relationship with him is based on your position in Christ Jesus. In Ephesians chapter 1, we see that we were placed into Jesus and sealed with the Holy Spirit. I said in previous videos, that it's almost like a hamster running in a, a little, you see those hamsters with those clear balls where they run around on the floor running in that ball that contains them. It's kind of like that picture. We're running around on this earth in that ball of Jesus sealed with the Holy Spirit. Our spirit is identical to Jesus, 1 John 4, 17. But our soul and our body must be dealt with. Romans chapter 12 and verse 1 says, I present my body a living sacrifice. Romans chapter 12 verse 2 says, I do not allow myself to be conformed to this world, but instead I transform myself by the renewing of my mind. How do we renew our mind? We renew our mind with the word of God, which goes back to Matthew chapter 4 and Jesus' statement to the devil, man lives by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. We find those words in written scripture. But when you look at the written Bible, you find 66 books in the Bible. You hear people talk about it being the word of God. I like to say, because it helps me, this is a perfect representation of the word of God, but it be, does not become the word of God until it gets into your spirit and becomes revelation knowledge. And so what Paul was telling us in Philippians chapter 3 and verse 8, Yea, doubtless I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. I said in the previous video that there is no room for self in serving God. Self does, cannot live in the presence of God. And therefore, as long as you are clinging to your achievements, as long as you are clinging to your abilities, as long as you are clinging to your training, your education, you will be hindered by a self-made barrier between you and God. God didn't put that barrier there. You're not having trouble hearing his voice. You're not having trouble following the Holy Spirit because God put up a barrier. It's there because you have allowed self in your life and self cannot stand in the presence of God. And that is why if you want to deal with yourself, nature, you spend time fellowshipping with the Holy Spirit. 2 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 14 says, The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. As we spend time fellowshipping with the Holy Spirit, meditating in the Word of God, we will find our focus becoming less about self and more about Him. Because self cannot stand in the presence of God. Self's place of death is in the presence. And the more time we spend in the presence, the more we will experience the death of our self nature. People struggle in this area because they try to do things from works to put their death their flesh. We choose to put on the new man by choosing to meditate in the word. We choose to put on the new man, as Paul t told us in Ephesians chapter four, we choose to put on the new man by opening scripture, by listening to the messages the Holy Spirit leads us to, by meditating upon the word day and night, by spending time in fellowship with the Holy Spirit. As we do that, we will find those habits that were clinging to us falling off. We will find those decisions, the wrong decisions, being made less and less time. But as long as you're clinging to yourself, 
nature, your abilities, your achievements, so on and so forth, you will have a self-made barrier between you and God. God is not the one who hardens the heart in our relationship with him. We harden our hearts by choosing to allow ourselves to be distracted from his word, from, his, from, that, from the Holy Spirit's presence in our life. He is with us and he's not leaving or forsaking us. But we choose to seek him through the word or we choose not to. Romans chapter 8, if you remember, we looked at this before in Romans chapter 8. In verse 5, it says, They that are after the flesh do mind of the things of the flesh. You could actually say, for they that are after the self do mind the things of the self. Are you trying to build your kingdom or his kingdom? If you're going to walk in the faith of the Son of God at the highest levels, if you're going to develop and see the power of God flowing through your life, as we all should be desiring to see, then you are going to have to mind the things of the Spirit. And that's why I said, but they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit, but to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace, because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither can be, so that they that are in the flesh cannot please God. Why is that? Because when you are walking according to your self-nature, when you are walking according to the input of your five physical senses, you cannot walk by the faith of the Son of God. And in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, we see that without faith, it is impossible to please God. So if you are walking in the flesh, you will not be walking in the Spirit, and you will not be walking by the faith that He has imparted to you when He gave you the measure of faith, and therefore you cannot please Him. I imagine that you are just like me and want to please God and want your life to be pleasing to Him. And the only way that is possible is for you to follow Paul's statement in Philippians chapter 3 when he says, I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. Where is that knowledge found? That knowledge is found in the Word of God. In Matthew chapter 4, we saw that man shall live by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. This is where we receive that revelation knowledge Paul is talking about when he talks about the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord. We count all things but lost. We count all of our achievements, all of our education. We count all of our abilities lost to pursue after that knowledge. And that knowledge is found in the Word of God. That knowledge is found in the revelation imparted by the Spirit of God as we fellowship with Him around the Word of God. And that's where Paul was telling us in Romans chapter 10 and verse 17, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. If you are going to walk at the highest levels of faith, as you, as you, as all of us desire to, then you're going to have to do and follow the example of Paul. I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge, for the excellency of the revelation, for the excellency of of the spiritual wisdom and revelation knowledge, I count all things but loss to walk in the mind of Christ, which has already been imparted in my spirit. And he says, For whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. And I think that's very interesting, because if we go back to Galatians chapter 1 again, you see Paul talking here, in verse 13, he says, For you have heard of my conversation in times past in the Jews' religion, how that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it, and profited in the Jews' religion above many my equals in my own nation, being more exceedingly zealous of the traditions of my father. So he profited in the Jews' religion above many of his equals. He excelled, in other words. He was a Pharisee of the Pharisees, he tells us in other places. But all of his accomplishments, all of his achievements, the ability for people to look at him and see the one who had risen to the highest levels in their religion, you, all the accolades that came with that, all the recognition, the ability to see at, sit at the head table, the ability to be recognized at synagogue when he walked in the door, he counted all of that loss. He counted that, it actually says he counted it all dung in comparison to the revelation knowledge received in times of fellowship with the Holy Spirit through the Word of God. 
He says, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them done. Why? That he may win Christ. The word Christ is a Greek word. It has never really been translated into English, but it means to be the anointed one in his anointing. He counted all of his achievements, everything he had gained, everything he had done, all of the accolades, all of the recognition that he had received. He counted it all dung because his goal was to pursue the anointing. His goal was to pursue Jesus and everything else up to that point that he met Jesus on the Damascus Road, he considered dung. Dung is a good, is a nice way of saying poop. He considered it all poop, <laughs> which is really, in our society, when we think about that, that is not a good thing. But that's how high he esteemed his abilities, his talents, his education when comparing them to the anointing into a relationship with Christ. His whole focus was on serving the Lord. And then it goes on to say, Philippians chapter 3 in verse 10, that I might know him in the power of his resurrection, in the fellowship of his sufferings, may be, being made conformable unto his death, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead, not as though I had already attained, either already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may app apprehend that for which I also am apprehended of Christ Jesus. You see, Paul counted all things but loss, all of his achievements in life, everything he had built, his entire career, he counted everything loss. Why? that he might know him in the power of his resurrection, that he might know, have that intimate, personal relationship with his creator. Jesus sent the Holy Spirit to be with us. We have the ability to fellowship with the Holy Spirit on a day-by-day -day basis, but it is our choice of whether we're going to open the word of God and spend time meditating on it day and night, allowing it to wash over us. Paul tells us in Ephesians, that we are washed with the water of the word of God. The choice is ours, but what choice are we going to make? Are we going to choose to cling to all of our accomplishments? Are we going to choose to continue to pursue the accolades, to get recognized by our peers, to have our family members think that we're just the most wonderful people, to have our coworkers praise us, to have the people at church give us awards for our service and our Bible memorization? Are we going to count all of that loss to pursue Christ? You see, self wants to be recognized. Self wants to be known. But it's kind of like when we started these videos. The Lord asked me, would you be willing to do this if no one ever watched a single video? Would you be willing to do what the Holy Spirit asks you to do if no one ever knew that you did it? If not one person acknowledged your service to the Lord, would you still be willing to do it? Is it enough just to know that you have done what he asked you to do? We have to look at our motivation why are we serving in the church on a week-by-day basis? Why do we want to be a Christian? What is our goal and our purpose? Does it bother us at work when somebody gets promoted over us? And I understand there's a righteous indignation, but why does it bother us? What is our motivation? Shouldn't we be willing to rejoice with that person who got promoted instead of looking and saying, well, I'm the one who deserved that. These are things we need to be considering. We need to be thinking about what is our motivation? What is our purpose? Why are we serving the Lord? Why are we believing for these things? Are we believing to build our kingdom? Or are we believing to build his kingdom? My wife and I used to go to a church and we've received excellent teaching. 
But there's one thing that you heard a lot. I would hear a staff member say, you know, you don't want to miss because somebody might want to pay off your house. Somebody might want to pay off your car. Somebody might want to bless you with a new car. And really, you've got to start looking at the motivation. Why are we attending church? Are we there to serve God or are we there to get our bills paid? Are we to, there to serve God or are we there to get a new car? What is our purpose? What is our motivation? Because self has no place in the presence of God. Self has no place. And as long as your motives are focused on self, what I can get, you know, bigger house, a better car, as long as your motivations are focused around self, they will not be focused on the service of the king. I count all things but loss. I count all things but dung. Can you say that with Paul? What is our motivation? What is our reasoning? We've been looking at the process of faith. We've been talking about faith. But why do we want to walk in higher levels of faith? Is it so we can get bigger houses, bigger cars, live at a better standard? Or is it because we want to serve Jesus and we want to have his power flow through us? If you want to walk in the highest levels of his power, then you will have to be able to honestly say with Paul, I count all things as dumb in comparison to Christ. Our time is up today. I thank you for joining me. Father, I thank you for each one that has joined me today. Holy Spirit, just search our hearts. Reveal to us, open the eyes of our understanding, our motives, our hidden reasons. Help us to put flesh to death. Help us to follow the instructions of Paul in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, where he says, I present my body. I present my selfish desires, a living sacrifice, and help us to pursue the excellency of knowledge by opening the eyes of understanding, giving us the spirit of wisdom and revelation, the knowledge of him, that we may know and see and experience the highest levels of everything that you have called and planned for us. In Jesus' name, amen.